Jewish movement had built itself upon the ideas of Trotsky and the experience all over Europe and elsewhere too that the, Stal the Stalinist parties were no longer revolutionary but were carrying out what it seemed to them to be the defense of the new revolutionary movement. So I went to France, I went to Italy, and I went around, and Britain, they came to Britain. I said, well, Paul, what? We, we have a pamphlet on this, and a pamphlet by Trotsky, and it's a pamphlet. So finally I got down and wrote it. And there is something that is very interesting about that. I was getting ready to write the Black Jacobins, the history of the revolution in San Domingo. I feel that if we are looking at his contribution, are we just looking at the Black Jacobins or his general works? I guess the Black Jacobin is, in my view, his primary contribution to historical sociology, but almost Correct. everything else he wrote. Has a little bit of that history. historical sociology. Yes. yes. Now, the, the good thing about the Black Jacobins, it's retelling the history of this grand revolution to create the first black... Am I supposed to watch the camera? No. Okay. It's retelling a, a history about the first black republic in the Western Hemisphere. So it is a history story, but more importantly, it deals with the human issue. The issue of leadership, the issue of Toussaint Louverture. Was he charismatic? How did he come into power? What was his um, antecedents, right, his family background? So what, what James did in Black Jacobins, he added the human touch to our revolution, to a historical process. And what I found to be interesting is that when he analyzed the players, the actors in that Black Jacobins, we are able to see, just as Mamie was a great lover of Shakespeare, mm -hmm. and Shakespeare always brought out our emotions, our values, greed, hate, love, this is what James brought out in that book. He brought out um, a quest for power, a rivalry between the blacks who were fighting to say for leadership, but more importantly, the conflict, the tension between the mulattoes and the blacks. So after they had gotten rid of the whites, the mulattoes and the blacks couldn't live together. And this is what the important contribution, I think, to the sociological element, to see that two non-white races couldn't share leadership. And even amongst the blacks, when we look at the other leaders who were there, we see that Tuse has a problem of trusting people around him. It has become more like, you know, Macbeth. You know, where Macbeth certainly doesn't know who to trust. This is what is happening in Tuse Louverture, um, his interaction with the other leaders. But more importantly, the sociological aspect also incorporates not just that black republic, but I believe the interaction with France. Mm -hmm. So it's a country versus country. It also has the anti-colonial, the anti-imperial feeling. And what James really achieves is that he is showing the stratification that persists. Even after the elite status quo, the whites were removed, there is still a lot of stratification. Slavery has ended, but there is still stratification along color lines, mm -hmm. along racial lines, as you would like to say. And similarly, the class remained they still had an upper class, a wealthy class, even though they were no longer whites. So I think this is what James brings out in his work a lot, that there is an element of continuity and change. Yes, you got rid of the whites, but there's still a lot of tension in society, still a lot of stratification. So I think this book is useful in understanding race relations, class relations after 1804, and more importantly, it shows how a society remains fractured and divided. A lot of times in sociology, as you know, when we are looking at um, society, we use theorists like Talcott Parsons to try to explain the functioning and the growth of a society. But I think James in this book, he is examining a society which is in transition, and it never really develops into a proper society. The Haitian society remains fractured. And what I have um, looked at 
in the 1980s, I looked at some newspaper clippings that they reviews of his plays and black Jacobins, and I realized that a lot of these reviewers were wondering if the issue of Papa Duck and Baby Duck, you know the Valleys mm -hmm. in Haiti, could this be a, a poison, could this be a problem that originally started from 1804 and it was never solved. So a lot of people have questioned this whole idea about the poverty in Haiti today. Is it a result of, should we put the blame as early as 1804, that the society never fully developed? It always remained fragmented and divided. And this I feel we need to understand better. This I feel is a message that James was trying to tell us in the Black Jacobins, that yes, you got rid of the whites, but still the society continued to develop problems. And he shows this in his work on Nkrumah and the, Ghana, in the revolution in Ghana, in that yes, Nkrumah came to power, but if after a few short years, Ghana continued to persist with problems. So what, what he did in Black Jacobins, it has persisted after colonialism. In the post-colonial era, we still see these problems persisting. So this, I feel, is a sociological aspect. Yes, it's a little bit political, but it shows the failure of human relations, the failure for us to overcome these racial, ethnic, class, even gender barriers. One point that James didn't bring up in the Black Jacobins was the issue of religion. Yes. And I think this is something that we need to examine, particularly in our society, Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean, where we have so many different faiths, Hinduism, Islam, Christianity. Yes, the society was primarily Christian, the Haitian society, but you also have to remember the slaves had their African religions. They had their voodoo, their obi, and thing. So I think this is what James should have brought out some more in Black Jacobins, mm -hmm. and this would have added a new dimension to the sociological aspect. Yes. I think he did that in three pages or so. Yeah, it was... 86 to 89. It uh, was too brief. Yes, but guess, given his materialist orientation, maybe he was trying to avoid mm. uh, mystifying <laughs> the revolution and offering a historical materialist explanation. Yeah. But that's a very important point you raised, the extent to which James moved away from an African explanation of the uprising mm. to, if you like, a European yes. paradigm for understanding what took place in Haiti. And I think that dilemma can be seen through the bulk of his work. Mm. He's always having to make that choice between uh, an African perspective and a European perspective. And almost always the European perspective wins out, even in his assessment of Nkrumah, but we will get to that when we come to political sociology. Uh, but that's a very important assessment, especially your review of the press reviews of the play. It's mm -hmm. a, we saw a copy of the play in the library, uh, but we haven't seen the book yeah, reviews. The 1936 play, I think, when that came out, mm -hmm. um, as you know, Paul Robson yes, in played London, in it, yes. played the leading role, and I think. Um, the, there was a mixed reception. Mm. Remember that time, it's a very racist society. Yes, still is. <laughs> and um, in fact, one reviewer, I believe it's in the magazine, The Stage, mm. that reviewer said um, that what James did was that he portrayed the whites to evil. Mm. He didn't show them as having any dignity or honor. So he took it more as an extreme. The reviewer is trying to show that he's too biased. Mm. You know, so I found that the, the critics were, some of them were a bit too harsh on him, particularly where it is his first real full-length play. Mm. You know, as amateur. Yes, that's an important bridge for us to talk a little about his contributions to the sociology of arts and popular Drama. culture, yeah. yes. I think because um, I feel that Nobody has really explored that dimension of James. Mm -hmm. What he did to drama, he was a sort of predecessor to Derek Walcott. And it was his intense like for Shakespeare that would have really brought out his dramatic skills. You know, and I, I feel that, I don't like to say this, but I don't feel London and Britain would have appreciated a play like that, particularly during a colonial era. This would have frightened a lot of the colonial authorities. Here we see a black man in a play overthrowing the whites in Haiti. It would have given ideas. And a lot of people believe 
that not just the staging of the play, but that the publication of the book influenced anti-colonial sentiment throughout the Third World Empire, throughout the British colonies and other colonies. So this book had a resounding effect, a rippling effect, the play and the book, even though the reviewers were a bit racist and things. But this is where I feel we need to look at this simple book, this idea creating positive change in our society. That is true. But do you know of any staging of the play in Trinidad or any other part of the Caribbean? Haiti, for example? Yeah. I, I'm not sure about if it was staged in Haiti, but I came across in the James Collection at UV right here that it was staged in Jamaica okay. by, I think, the Graduate Theatre. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a tape in UV, mm -hmm. a VHS tape, where I believe the play was staged in Trinidad. Okay. Right? Many years ago. It must be the tape we saw. I suppose mm -hmm. in the 70s. Of course, the audio was bad. It was, yes. Right? But um, I want to believe that our society, the Caribbean society, I don't think we really appreciate a play like that, the yeah. staging of a play. We like to go, and Zofia will tell you, the mm -hmm. comedy. Mm -hmm. We want to go and hear about Pekong and we'll talk mm -hmm. and thing, you know. Mm -hmm. But that play is a play for middle class audiences, a play where you would have to have um, an intellectual appreciation mm -hmm. of that. So it's very unfortunate that I don't think for the last 15, 20 years that mm -hmm. play has been staged in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Um, what is your assessment of his uh, Beyond the Boundary and, on the one hand, American civilization, where he dealt with uh, American comics and popular cultural writers right. in some detail? I think that in the first book, Beyond the Boundary, that you talked about, that is a book, as you would know, James always wrote in a metaphorical style, mm -hmm. and that book it's a, it's a groundbreaking book. It's a pioneering book in that it is one of the first books that deal with a sport as important as cricket. Mm. A sport that the West Indians have grown up to love. And that book, it takes us from a local level, the village level, to an international level. This is how the book moves on two phases. And this is why I think the book has been so relevant and people are still quoting and people are still seeing it as important because it's a, it's a book that is not just distant. It doesn't just talk about West Indies cricket. It talks about the local cricket too. But what, what a lot of historians and art scholars have realized is that beyond the boundary had certain dimensions, the class dimension and of course the race dimension. It was showing here the emergence of black West Indians into a sporting arena that was previously dominated by the whites. It is a game cricket that the, the English tend to cherish, just as they would cherish tea drinking. Mm -hmm. And they held this very close to their heart, the English people, the British people. So the, uh, what, black, what um, Beyond the Boundary did, it showed that a defeat in the game, a sporting defeat, could have led to a political defeat. So it was a foundation for us to get independence, for us to end colonialism. It was showing, and a lot of people don't realize this, the potential of the black man in the Caribbean to get political independence, to get self-government. If a black man could go out there and perform so well with the bat and ball, he could go out there and rule himself. So I feel a lot of people need to look at this book again and need to read between the lines, as James would always write. And um, you would know, Professor, that um, he did he helped Larry Constantine, right, with his autobiography, and he was he wrote articles for the Manchester Guardian. What I found in my readings is that James had a brilliant memory. He didn't just quote Marx and Shakespeare and things, but he would read these cricket in almanacs. So he he had a passion for this cricket, just as today in Trinidad we have a passion for football, mm -hmm. and as you would know last year the Soccer Warriors. Mm -hmm. This is James' passion for cricket. He lived and breathed cricket, and he saw, which is very um, interesting with James, he never created boundaries in his life. He always saw cricket linked to politics, yes. cricket linked to culture, cricket linked to ex explanation of the society. And this is his interpretation, just as Hegel, the philosophical um, interpretation mm -hmm. of you cannot look at things in a vacuum, mm -hmm. You have to look at art, society, religion connected. Mm -hmm. James looked at cricket as being connected to West Indian society. 
So just as black Jacobins were sending a message to the future, this book Beyond the Boundary was sending a message. It was given hope to these people that you could perform well in cricket. A lot of people haven't explored the fact that even though Beyond the Boundary talked about the Afro-Caribbean person, he was also speaking to the Indo-Caribbean person. Oh. Because we had Indo-Caribbean cricketers, the mm. Rohan Kanhai and thing. So I feel that um, we need to also understand that the message James was sending, and I will, I will come back to this later on, is that, and it's a very important sociological message, the need for all races to realize their potential. You are treated um, with scant respect, you are despised by the colonial authorities, and what he is trying to provide, he's giving you inspiration. He is showing you that, here what, this is what we are capable of. We are capable of dominating the game of cricket. We are capable of beating the British at their own game. So this is what he was trying to tell them, and this is what I believe is an unwritten message that we need to revisit. Yes, yes, I particularly like that chapter in the book on the darker and the lighter, where he dealt with race exclusion from certain teams and why he chose to join a lighter skin team. Yeah. Uh, I think there yeah, he also talks about the Chinese immigrant yeah. sponsoring the local cricket team so that after the game people will go back to his shop <laughs> and discuss how the game went. Yeah, yeah. I thought those were very powerful insights I would not have got in any other book uh, about the Caribbean as I was coming here so I made sure I had to read the book before coming. But my question is, isn't James giving too much credit mm -hmm. to cricket as a metaphor for the good manners of mm -hmm. the Caribbean? <laughs> because he says it again and again that yeah. win or lose, you got to be, you are trained to be nice to the other side, yeah. well tried, yeah. better luck next time and stuff like that. But isn't that part of the Caribbean hospitality rather than a credit to cricket? Because in England, mm -hmm. they do have cricket or invented it, but they are ever so rude. Right. <laughs> I'm British, right, right. Uh, which goes back again to that paradigm shift in right. the Black Jacobin where James apparently cel celebrates the European above what is originally Caribbean. Yeah. Uh, maybe too, mu too much of the celebration, I would have thought. You brought up a very interesting point, and yeah. I have found this. A lot of people don't like it when I say it. But James has a strong Eurocentric bias mm -hmm. in his writings and his interpretations of society. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was a Pan-Africanist. Yes, he had the Caribbean at heart. But if you analyze James' story, you would realize he spent most of his life abroad. Mm -hmm. He spent a lot of time in the United States. He spent a lot of time in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, spent some time in Africa. But James, his interpretation of society, of the Caribbean civilization, tended too much to use Eurocentric theories, European theories. Mm. I have this book here, Modern Politics, yes. based on some lectures that James gave in Trinidad. And I realized when I flipped through this book that um, he didn't focus on Caribbean intellectuals such as Arthur Lewis, mm. who was up and coming at that time. And what I feel James should have done is that he should have also um, looked within the Caribbean and focus more on some of these important slave leaders from the past. Look at indentureship and look at some of these leaders. Mm. But too often, he would talk about Plato and Socrates and Hegel. Mm -hmm. And now this is all well and good, but he needed to move away from that. And he needed to look at our unique Caribbean civilization that has been shaped by slavery mm. and indentureship and imperialism. Mm. Because he is trying to find a solution for our problems in the Caribbean and also in Africa, developing countries. Mm. And we hear him talking about city-states in Athens, mm. in Greece. Yes. We hear him talking about their great democracy in ancient mm. Greece. Mm. We hear him um, praising how every cook could govern, yes. you know, and um, democracy is for all. Yes. And I'm a bit taken back and I'm yeah. wondering, do, does Jim, is James trying to imply that we Caribbean has the Caribbean had no tinkers, mm. they had no people who discussed these ideas. Mm. So this is one of the faults that a lot of scholars are afraid to address and examine properly. Mm. In that, if you look at his 
his whole ideas. Yes, he's a Marxist, he was a trust, yeah. Mm -hmm. But then again, Jim should have developed a unique theory and apply it to Africa and apply it to the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. He's talking about the Hungarian Revolution mm -hmm. and the Russian Revolution. But but please, these I for Europe, our civilization is different. Mm -hmm. We are small island states. Mm -hmm. We are not huge continents. So I feel this is the problem that a lot of Jamesian scholars, they are so a little biased. Mm -hmm. They worship James and they are afraid to criticize him mm -hmm. and analyze him and see where this is where James had a problem. There's a distinct break mm -hmm. in his analysis of the Caribbean society. And we see it coming up in Beyond the Boundary. Yes. Yes, I think it's probably as a result of his uh, classical education mm -hmm. at, Queens, at QRC yeah, you know, your and the primary school. Yes, yeah, but your discomfort with his celebration of Athens, I also share as a society coming out from slavery. Mm -hmm. I don't see how any Caribbean would hold up <laughs> Athens as a model of democracy. It was not a democracy. There was still slavery. Of Women were not citizens. Mm -hmm. Out of 500,000 people in Athens, there were only 50,000 citizens. So that tells you a lot about the limitation of what they did call democracies. And Similarly for Rome. Yes. He, he talked about Rome. Yes. Rome was persecuting Christians. Yes, but right? similarly for America, he celebrated America more than I would have thought uh, necessary, mm -hmm. given the way shabby way he was treated, being deported, but he was still in the deportation cell, writing in praise of uh, Moby Dick and yeah. American civilization. As you talk about that book, I know you had asked me. Sorry to intervene. Go ahead. Go ahead. When I read American Civilization, mm -hmm. I was a bit surprised mm -hmm. that he is so fond of American culture. Mm -hmm. He is talking about the comics and the art yes. and the novelists and yes. things. And this, I feel, is an inherent bias. Mm -hmm. The same way he has a, a passion for Eurocentric yes. theories yes. and ideas. Mm -hmm. I was a bit dismayed and discouraged mm -hmm. because he knew about the racism. Yes. He knew about the slavery. He talked about it. He too. knew about the Jim Crow era. Yes. He knew about people who were lynched. Yes. The same black people. The working class struggles. He knew he about the sharecroppers. Yes. Yes. You know. He talked about all of them in the book, but still celebrated America, and that is courageous for somebody who was on the left. Yeah. He was saying, yes, we can be critical of America, but uh -huh. we should not forget the achievements that the ordinary people have made, and that was the whole idea of the character Dick Tracy, yeah. that he was not a professional <laughs> investigator, he was uh, just an average Joe Bloke, yeah. <laughs> and something happened to his girlfriend's father, and he decided to get a revenge, that Americans love that kind of mm -hmm. down-to-earth heroism, yeah. uh, but still, <laughs> let's move on, I guess. But you mentioned, let's, let me just finish up this American Civilization Analysis, I feel that those who are looking at his interpretation of American civilization have to remember that he knew the FBI, the FBI, sorry, the CIA probably were listening to his speeches, yep. watching his writings. Mm -hmm. And as you know, James he wrote in a very metaphorical style. Mm -hmm. And I feel he was writing in codes. And he didn't use his name. He didn't use, well, you know, he used the J.R. Johnson. Yes. He had the J.R. Johnson yes. for his tendency. Mm -hmm. But I feel that in that American civilization, mm -hmm. I want to believe that at times he was mocking the American society. That is uh, true. I think it was more than mocking, it mm. was very critical, especially mm. the way that the Ford Motor Company would recruit criminals to right. go and break strikes, yeah. literally break strikes. But he never said it out blatantly. Yeah, he, he was still uh, reluctant to reject everything American, and yeah. hardly anybody would. America is still a great country. Yeah, yeah but he was on the side of uh, America too, uh, too much for comfort for a lot of people who know exactly what American imperialism means mm -hmm. uh, on a global scale. Yeah. I think what we also have to remember too, we have to compare American civilization, his book, to mm -hmm. how he looked at the 1960s mm -hmm. when black power erupted, yes. yes. you know, and his links with um, Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. Martin